Hello boys and girls, this is Daniel for Rock the JVM, and in this video I'm going to talk about objects and companions in Scala. Now, this video is more beginner friendly, so if you're starting out with Scala and you're interested in some of its core distinguishing features, this video will be for you. And my recommendation here would be to write the code with me in this video just so that you can get a hand on it. And whenever you need to refresh your memory about these concepts, just refer back to this video or to the blog at the link in the description. So without further ado, let's move to the code. And here I am in IntelliJ IDEA with the Scala plugin and installed and I've created an object here in my file explorer so if you go to your file explorer under source main Scala you can right click and you can create a new Scala class you can name this however you like I named it objects and companions and select object here in the selector and I've already created an object here for you and um, you can type in main here and then type in enter to create a main method that you can execute so if you right click on this code you'll have the option to run it and if you click the run button this will compile your code and this will run your application of course with nothing to show for now so I will explain what an object is and why this main method only makes sense for objects. So if you're in the process of learning Scala, you're probably well aware that Scala allows a blend of object orientation plus functional programming. So Scala can declare classes much like Java or any other common object-oriented languages. So if you define a class, let's call this person with the name, with first name as a string and a last name as a string this is a proper class and this signature over here is also the signature of its constructor and inside these curly braces you can define fields and methods much like in java or other object oriented languages however when you learned object orientation, I'm pretty sure that most of the people watching this video are already familiar with the object oriented style of writing code. So when you learned object oriented programming in the language of your choice, probably uh, Java, but not necessarily, the next step after learning the object oriented principles was to structure your code so that you don't duplicate logic or find yourself tangled in your own code. So you learned object oriented design patterns. And um, one of the first object-oriented design patterns that we usually learn after learning the object-oriented principles is the singleton pattern. And singleton pattern is making sure that only one instance of a type is present in our entire code base. All right. Now, there are several possible solutions and implementations of the singleton pattern on different levels of cleanliness and thread safety. And uh, if you explore the singleton pattern in very, very deep details, you probably encountered pretty complex scenarios and initialization strategies for singletons, such that the thread safety is taken into account and so on and so forth. However, Scala makes it super easy to implement the singleton pattern, and all you have to do is just do this object my singleton and that is it so this declaration defines both a type which is my singleton and the only possible instance of this type which is the object in other words the singleton pattern is implemented in a single line and in Scala we call this an object which is what you also defined by creating this file over here so thread safety is not an issue here because this instance, my singleton, is available immediately once your application starts. And singleton declarations work like class declarations in the sense that we can define fields and methods on them. So for example, if I define an object called cluster singleton, if you want to define a multi-machine application, you can define values here, let's call this max nodes equals 20 for example if you want to distribute your application in between 20 machines and if you want to define a method let get number of nodes and just return some sort of implementation here i'm just going to return the number 42. so you can define fields and methods here on an object much like you can on classes all right and later if you want to use this cluster singleton you can define for example val max nodes equals cluster singleton like the type and the instance of that type so you can use the cluster singleton as a value and then you can say dot max nodes 
So you're accessing the field of this instance. And likewise for the methods. So this is pretty darn useful. So objects are useful as they are, as implementing the singleton pattern in a single line, but the singleton pattern was not the actual main reason why this object concept was introduced into the Scala language as a first class structure. In short, it is possible to have a class plus object with the same name in the same file. And these combinations are called companions. So for example, if I define a class, let's call this kid with a name and an age as an int. And I'm going to define a method called greet, assuming this kid was educated to say hi in a very polite way. For example, hello, my name is and I'm going to inject name here, and I'm age years old, All right? So I've just defined a method here on the class kid. We can also define an object with the same name in the same file, and you can define an object called kid. Now, bear in mind, objects do not have parameters because it doesn't make sense. The objects are immediately constructed once the object definition is loaded. And so in the object, I can define fields or methods that do not depend on any particular instance of kid. For example, if I define a val called likes vegetables, which is a Boolean, and we know kids do not in general like vegetables. So this is a preconception, but, and I'm pretty sure there are exceptions to that, but let's assume that all kids hate vegetables. Regardless, we say that the class kid and the object kid are called companions. And more often we say that the object kid, this thing, is a companion object of the class. All right. Now, companions have the property that they can access each other's private fields and methods. So, for example, if I define this likes vegetable thing as private, I can access likes vegetables here from the class. So, for example, if I wanted to complete this method greet, I could say, do I like vegetables? And then I would inject kid dot likes vegetables and notice that the likes vegetables uh, value here is accessible in the kid class but not outside so if I say val kids like vegetables I would say kid dot likes vegetables or I could try writing that but this field here is not visible and notice that the compiler also tells me that so companions can access each other's private fields now this class object combo is very powerful because we can use the fields and methods on the kid class for instance related logic. For example, each kid instance has a method called greet. And on the other hand, you might want to have code that does not depend on any instance of kid. Does this ring a bell in other languages? I'm going to give you a second to think about it, and you might even want to pause the video if you want to think about it for yourself. Now, in many languages, instance independent code is usually called static in other languages, most notably Java. So in Java, if you were to write this kind of code in Java, we would write a class that would have a method called greet, a public constructor, and a static value likes vegetables of type boolean. So you would say something like static boolean likes vegetables equals false. So this would be an equivalent Java declaration for this val over here that we have for the object. So this is an interesting thing because in Scala, notice how we separated the code in the class for instance dependent logic and in the companion object for instance independent logic. So the secret purpose of a companion object as a best practice is to store static fields and methods. So companion objects are for static fields and methods. Now, to further prove the equivalence, Scala code written in this form with a class and a companion object in the same with the same name in the same file compiles to the same bytecode as a Java class with a static variable.
All right, so just take my word for it. This kind of code compiles to the same bytecode as a Java class with a public constructor, a public method called greed, and a private static Boolean likes vegetables equals false. All right. Now, all the logic that we can write in Scala, at least in Scala 2, can only exist within a class or an object. So in Scala 2, you would not be able to define methods or values outside of classes or objects. Therefore, all the logic that we write belongs to some instance of some type, either to instances of the class or to the object, which, like I said, is the only instance of its own type, which means that Scala is purely object-oriented. Now, Scala 3 will change that because because we'll soon be allowed to write top-level values and method declarations. In particular, I am in a Scala 3 project, so outside of any classes or objects, I can define val x equals 43, and this would be perfectly fine in Scala 3. In Scala 2, this kind of declaration is invalid, so every code that we write belongs to a class or an object. Now, another small difference to be aware of, which might be a little bit more consequential, the type of a class is different from the type of its companion object. I was a little bit more careful in the previous few minutes to say that this object is the only instance of its type, but I didn't really say what its type was. This is important because if we have a method which receives a kid argument, for example, we cannot pass the kid companion object in there as a value. So for example, if I define a value or a method, play game and I would pass a kid as an argument and I would say for example print line playing a game with a kid or something like that the implementation is really not significant here I would be able to define a value of type kid for example if I defined a value called Bobby equals new kid with a name Bobby and age 9 I would be able to say play game with Bobby. Because Bobby is a kid, I have no trouble passing that as an argument. But if I were to say play game with the kid companion object, which I said earlier is also the only value of its type, notice that we have a compiler error. That is because the types are actually different. Because to be truly technical, the type of the kid object here is known to the compiler as kid dot type, which is different than kid the class name. And this is what we are going to see in the compiler error as well. So if I hover over this, I'm going to see a small pop up found a type. Come on, found kid dot type. And I'm interested in kid. All right, so I need a kid instance and I got kid dot type. Kid dot type is the type of the companion object. And I'm going to explain how dot type works in general in the Scala compiler in a more advanced future video. But just remember that the kid companion object does not share the type of all the kid instances. All right, so we discussed about Scala's objects as implementing the singleton pattern in one line, and then we explore the class object companions in Scala and all the implications. We learned a best practice structure of our code and how to split it between the class and the companion object. So if you like this video, go ahead and click the like button for me and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. And check out my Twitter and LinkedIn where I share updates on upcoming material. I'm dying for feedback, so please leave your comments below. I read every single comment. And check out the Rock the JVM website. We have tons of articles and videos and courses that will help you master Scala and related tech. In the meantime, I'm Daniel signing off.